hi everyone welcome to my podcast called inspirational dentistry with dr Midassa. so firstly let me just start off by thanking the organization organizers of i love dentistry for inviting me on this group and being able to help and serve the dental community so i'm relatively new to this group and i'm new to probably most people who are watching this this podcast and listening in so i just thought i'd introduce you guys to who i am so I've been a qualified dentist for over 11 years. I'm a dentist and a coach, and I'm based actually in the UK. So I dedicate three to four days uh, in clinical dentistry, and the rest I... Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm a dentist and a coach, and I spend three to four days in clinical dentistry, and the rest I spe spend and serve helping others achieve their dreams and aspirations. I'm also doing a part time in medical law and ethics and undergoing expert witness training. So the purpose of this podcast is to help inspire people, hopefully motivate people and talk about interesting topics within within dentistry. So uh, my first guest here today is Dr. Radfar. Um, he's a dentist who's based in uh, L.A. and he has a special interest in sleep apnea and TMJ dysfunction. Dr. Radfar has made it his mission to help improve sleep quality by finding solutions to insomnia, sleep apnea, and TMJ dysfunction. Um, so it's one of his uh, passions and purpose in it. And he's found, you know, having to solve this problem of insomnia. And we were actually on a podcast earlier this week discussing his, his, his story as a dentist, as well as talking a little bit about sleep apnea and how, um, you know, how it's on the rise. So welcome, Dr. Radfar, to, to my podcast. Um, how are you today? Uh, thanks for having me on, Dr. Hussein. I'm doing great. Um, it's, you know, uh, nice weather here in California. So we'll, we'll enjoy that. Um, uh, really excited to be on uh, with you today. I know we spoke a few days ago personally. Uh, I had a great conversation with you. I think you're great at what you do. So I'm excited for, uh, for uh, sharing all the wealth and knowledge that I have to the listeners out there about sleep apnea and how to incorporate it into their practice and or how to look for it. And also we'll talk a little bit about how to be able to be profitable from it. Why not? Right. Um, so we'll discuss all that today. Excellent. Excellent. For those who may not have heard of my uh, podcast it's called Diary of a Dental Coach, it's really, really inspiring. And Dr. Radfar is actually one of the most inspirational dentists I've met he his story if you listen to it is very very genuine very very open very very transparent and there's so much that you can learn from his life story and and you can see what made him take and drive his way to success so tell us your backstory to you know your interest in sleep apnea and tmj dysfunction yeah so in uh, 2009 um on one evening i fell asleep at the wheel and i crashed my car into a tree um, luckily, nobody was in the car with me. Um, I'm blessed that I didn't uh, crash into another family or, 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 or another car. I was, it was a tree about a block away from my home. I almost made it home. Um, I had no idea at the age of 32, now I'm 45, uh, that I was suffering from sleep apnea. Uh, one of the biggest things was daytime sleepiness. I was a little bit more tired throughout the day. Clearly, I was fell asleep at the wheel. Um, and uh, I was told that I started snoring. So these were a little bit indications that I was uh, ignoring. Um, and at the time, I'm six foot tall, uh, 165 pounds. So I was not overweight. I am, don't think I'm overweight now. Uh, so you know, it wasn't like judge a book by its cover where you think just you're overweight. So that propelled me into uh, getting a sleep study, becoming a patient, actually. Um, I, many of the listeners here may have uh, themselves have had issues with sleep, or maybe they have loved ones or staff members. The best way to start is with someone dear to you or, or someone that works in your office. Uh, have a conversation with your staff, right? Um, and that's how it, I was the patient. So home sleep test, I have uh, mild apnea. Uh, they gave me a CPAP machine, which is that continuous positive airway pressure. No, no good for me. I was part of the 80% that rejected it. And then uh, lo and behold, in 2010, the oral appliance was put on the market and kind of uh, approved by Medicare guidelines here in, in the U.S. And so I was one of the first ones to get one. Fast forward later, I've uh, treated a few thousand patients with oral appliances, and uh, we'll discuss some of the other remedies that I've uh, been able to create. 
absolutely excellent. It's a fascinating story. So just wanted you to sort of clearly define for the viewers and listeners here, what exactly is sleep apnea? Yeah, so sleep apnea is uh, two things that can happen. You either have a complete stoppage of breathing or you have a what we call hypopnea, which is a shortness of breath of at least 50% or more and your oxygen saturation, um, that little pulse ox goes down by at least 3%. So it's not necessarily just snoring. People can snore and not have apnea. You actually have to have some sort of cessation or stoppage of breathing or a shortness of oxygen or breath by at least 50% of your normal breath. That's uh, done only through a sleep study. You can't do it on apps and, or, and whatnot. The accuracy is really on a four channel home sleep study or in lab study, which we will we'll go over the different types of studies. Um, once you're diagnosed with sleep apnea by a board certified sleep physician, a dentist cannot diagnose a patient. Uh, the patient has to be referred for a home sleep test, which there are plenty of companies that do that. And dentists for most states in America, uh, I believe 48 states can refer for a home sleep test um, or they can refer to their MD. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss how that, that could be done as well. So um, obviously, uh, this is all related to how, um, TMJ dysfunction as well. So, um, and bruxism as well as, uh, I mean, how, how are they related, TMJ dysfunction and sleep apnea? So, so my favorite uh, conversation I have with my patients, one of my favorites is in the last 20 years of being a dentist is, Doc, how am I grinding my teeth when I sleep with my mouth open, right? <laughs> I'm snoring with my mouth open and you look in their mouth and you see bruxism. Well, classic TMJ or bruxism associated with sleep apnea is lower anterior wear. Um, it's almost like your, your mouth is open, you get an obstruction of air, so the air isn't going in, and you get into this fight or flight response, like someone's suffocating you, and you slam your teeth together, and there goes the clench, right? The, the, the masseter, the temporalis, the SCM, all the neck muscle, everything clenches down, and you grind your teeth, you bring your lower jaw forward, and the upper and front teeth kind of, if, especially if they're class one or class two, basically a normal bite, grind against each other and you get wear of your front teeth. Um, it's not left and right clenching or grinding per se. It's more of a lower forward movement. Really, in essence, what you're doing is you're opening up your own airway by bringing your lower jaw forward, which bring your tongue forward and creating more room where the tongue and the palate can get a suction effect, which is called sleep apnea. So more room by bringing the tongue forward, what an oral appliance does, you're doing that naturally through a clench and through a forward grind. Excellent. That's a great description of, of describing how this phenomenon happens. Uh, so what are the risk factors and, and who are the people who are most likely to suffer from sleep apnea and TMJ dysfunction? So, so majority of uh, sleep apnea patients uh, fall in the 40 and over category. That doesn't mean patients like 32 years old, like myself, uh, won't have it. Um, and, you know, you, again, 70% uh, plus in America are, are men, about 30% are women. Um, and again, don't judge a book by its cover. You can't throw weight into it, but definitely overweight. Uh, or, or, or a high uh, metabolic uh, uh, index does contribute to it because of the constriction of the neck, uh, 17 and a half inch bigger or bigger neck uh, for men, uh, 14 and a half or bigger for women can be indicators um, of, of sleep apnea. So you're looking at a demographic um, of 40 and over. This is sleep apnea only. We're not talking insomnia. Insomnia and anxiety and whatnot can range from uh, my daughter who's 15, 16 years old, uh, you know, to, you know, 80s and 90s. I mean, that, that's all over the place. And that's not obstructive. That's more uh, um, uh, kind of like a central nervous system. So uh, th th that's your ideal candidate is someone in their over 40 years old. Um, and it, typically it's a male, but not necessarily 30% are female. And most are overweight. Are there any medical conditions that put you at increased risk? So one of the most brilliant things a dentist can do without, you know, uh, really being that much versed on sleep apnea is looking at their medical conditions, or we call it comorbidities, right? And so the biggest comorbidities out there are high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, um, uh, acid reflux, 
uh, history of cancer, um, uh, depression or mood disorders, um, the erectile dysfunction, it's the second leading cause of erectile dysfunction. Um, and the list goes on, stroke, heart attack. Uh, so there's a lot of medical conditions that are associated with sleep. So what I do, I review the medical history for every patient, whether it's an existing patient on their checkups or their new patients. And when I see one of these comorbidities link to possibility sleep apnea being a cause, for example, studies have been shown about 30% of patients that are on high blood pressure medication, three out of 10, for example, are directly related to sleep apnea. You fix their sleep by an oral appliance or a sleep machine, uh, oxygen machine called the CPAP, you can get 30% of patients off their blood pressure medication. So it behooves us when we look at a medical history to be able to have a simple conversation with our patients after going and examine the mouth, which we'll also go over the, some of the stuff in the mouth to look for, right? Um, what, what kind of questions sh should, should we be asking all our patients about their sleep habits and what kind of questions would, or would it just be if they complained of perhaps TM, TMJ problems or, or pain like that? Where, so, so would, on, would you on have a conversation with day, all your patients? Yeah, on a typical day, um, you know, let's say I have 10 hygiene patients and three new patients. My new patients get a sleep questionnaire, every single one of them. Um, if you want to incorporate this into your office, give it to every new patient. The sleep questionnaire has, do you snore? Have you fallen asleep at the wheel? Do you fall asleep easy when you watch TV? Are you tired throughout the day? Do you have acid reflux? Do you have high blood pressure? All these things that are connected or correlated to sleep. Um, the, 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 there's one called Bang, B-A-N-G, or a uh, question, there's, there's, it's called Stop Bang. Uh, there's a lot of Epworth questionnaire. Epworth is another one. Um, they can be found online, sleep apnea questionnaire, just Google that. Um, and those are given to all my new patients. My existing patients that are here just for a cleaning, here just for my crown, may give you resistance when you give them this let's call it form on a clipboard, right? So I have a conversation with them after I look at their medical history, look in their mouth, and I just ask them, hey doc, or hey Mike, how do you, how do you sleep at night? Do you sleep well? And they can blatantly lie to you on the form <laughs> or in the chair. You know, they're, they're sitting there kind of, you can hear a little snore sound while they're wide awake even, right? Because they're, they're, they're struggling with their breathing and especially nasal breathing. And uh, they're, oh yeah, I sleep great. Okay, great. You know, because the reason why I ask you is that when I was looking in your mouth, I saw X, Y, and Z. It's correlated to the medical history. I was a little concerned. Um, if you ever want me to help you in that, Mike, you let me know. Um, and 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 so and I just leave it at that. And sometimes the funny thing is, uh, Doctor Hussein is is they come back six months later and they're like, Hey, you remember you were talking to me about if I snore, if I sleep okay? Now my wife is telling me, or my husband is telling me, I'm having. You know, she's sleeping on the couch now. And well, what can I do with that? Uh, initially, they may have a fear to, or an embarrassment really to tell you, um, but plant the seed by asking the question. Do, uh, has anyone told you that you snore? Do you sleep well throughout the night? Are you tired throughout the day? Um, it's funny, uh, we've all had patients, if we're dentists, uh, you know, that, that come in and say, I, I drink a lot of coffee. I wanna wipe my teeth. Well, what's a timeout? Why are you drinking lots of coffee? <laughs> you know, you're, you're, are you getting enough sleep? Um, is it, you know, anxiety based or apnea based? So that's a conversation that leads into um, questions about their sleep. Yeah, what, what I find interesting, obviously, being privileged, being a dentist and working in this kind of setting, there's no other sort of job, I would say, or career where you actually see that patient uh, so every, regularly every six months they're coming back to see you so you develop that kind of rapport with them they trust you and even you know they trust you probably sometimes more than perhaps even a, a medical physician they'll talk to you about their own personal problems and you develop that kind of trusting relationship and that's the the amazing thing about being a being a dentist and having that sort of close close relationship with people and I think it's interesting that we almost uh, you know sleep we like um, you know, we, we spend over 25 years on average and sleeping and it's something we don't really think about. But in recent times, it's become an increased problem, just like 
uh, bruxism and TMJ dysfunction. And, and we all know during the pandemic as well, we all saw those patients that, that cracked those cusps and kept coming in with broken teeth. And, and, and you know, they, they may not have had problems for years and suddenly you're getting a massive influx of patients breaking teeth. So, um, you know, what's, you know, when we're doing our clinical examination, um, so we're doing our extra oral exam, intra oral exam, what things are we looking for with regards to TMJ dysfunction as well as sleep apnea? And what, what are the telltale signs in, when we're examining our patients? Right. So this is a great, great question for, you know, I love dentistry listeners here. Uh, we talked about the medical comorbidities that we look at, right? So I'm not, I, don't, I don't even have to look at a patient's mouth or face. I can almost say, okay, I, have a, I should have a conversation with them and ask them, how well do you sleep at night? Anyone tell you that you snore? Are you tired throughout the day? Do you get acid reflux? Like if there's certain things that frequent nighttime urination, nocturia, uh, it, you know, we have this relationship you were talking about with our patients more than any other profession. In 20 years, I get to see the husband, the wife, the grandma, the aunt, the coworker, the employee on a one to five times, sometimes 10 times basis a year. It's brilliant. And they do value their, your trust and your opinion on certain things that is really up. This is, this is coming from the heart. You're trying to help them do one third of their life is sleep and you're trying to help them do it better to lead to better uh, medical and oral health. So the oral health that gets affected from a patient that has, or something that causes sleep apnea is dry mouth. One of the things that dry mouth, breathing through your mouth, mouth breathers are more likely to have sleep apnea. What does dry mouth look like? more buildup in the lower anteriors with tartar, right? Uh, and, and, and when they're having a little bit more of a dry mouth, they have, to have tendency to build up a little bit more plaque. Um, large scalloped tongue. So when you look at the tongue and you're look, looking inside the mouth, the sides of the tongue have little ridges or indentations called scalloping. The reason why the sides of the tongue scallops is because as they thrust their tongue forward during that TMJ clench movement, as they bring their jaw forward, the tongue comes forward, the tongue hits the inside of the teeth, we call it lingual embrasures, right? And literally becomes pierced, called scalloping. So scalloping on the sides of the tongue is a big indication for large scalloped tongue. The wear that we discussed, lower anterior wear, uh, that is a big landmark to ask the patient you know, do you sleep well at night? Um, you can look at the tonsils and large tonsils in the back. There's something called malampati classification. Malampati three and four is more likely to have sleep apnea. It's basically how the slope of your soft palate is. If, you, if the patient sticks their tongue out and just doesn't say, ah, just sticks their tongue out and you can't see that punching bag or that uvula, all you see is the palate still. If you imagine when they're asleep, it's gonna, the tongue's gonna be closer to that palate. That's malampati four. Um, whenever you go under general anesthetic, the anesthesiologist checks for that to make sure that when they intubate you, they don't pull the tube out too quickly and you can literally suffocate on the table. So those are the big key obvious uh, landmarks or things to look for is lower anterior wear, large scallop tongue and the malampati. Um, you know, there's other things like buccal composites that we need to do, abrasions that occur all over the place have a lot to do with acid reflux or acid erosion. 60% of acid reflux or GERD patients is sleep apnea associated. So that's another uh, landmark to look at. Narrow arches, very small narrow arches don't have room for the tongue to sit in. Um, pushes the tongue back, causes obstruction or, or sleep apnea. So these are kind of like, uh, I call them pearls, to, to look at when you're looking in the mouth uh, of the patient. Absolutely, yeah. What about extra orally? Um, you know, obviously with TMD dysfunction, what obviously the patient may uh, explain some of their symptoms, but what things are we looking for in terms of TMJ dysfunction and things like that? Yeah, extra orally, um, you know, of course there's popping, clicking of the jaw that can occur. Um, and, and, but more importantly, when you look at a face, if you see a retruded mandible, a class two uh, in, in orthodontic standards, molar bigger than molar, uh, uh, three millimeters molar class two. Um, the retreated jaw means the tongue is further back 
against closer to that soft palate as the tongue is attached to the lower jaw. So that was one of the easier ones to look at someone's face extra orally and be able to tell that. Of course, some of the patient's masseters are, you can tell their, their cheek muscles are very large. That's an indication of clenching. Um, and that could be, again, uh, associated with sleep apnea. So when somebody comes in with, um, I mean, everyone, is, sometimes it's very difficult to actually diagnose, I think, uh, bruxism in a patient or, well, or TMJ problem, because sometimes they don't always present in the classic way of jaw pain. Sometimes it can be a particular tooth and the, the patient sort of says it's definitely from this area and it's definitely toothache and you might take x-rays and you might do all your tests and still can't find anything and then obviously once you rule out the obvious causes you then obviously start to look at the you know other types of causes that even perhaps you can't see on an x-ray or perhaps you can't see clinically and and things like that so and everyone has their own little way of treating tmd so a, you know a patient who you really strongly suspect and and is really complaining of the classic symptoms of uh, TMD dysfunction. How? What is your management for an acute onset of a patient like that? So, so when a patient comes in and has complaints of, let's say, popping, clicking of the jaw or tightness of the jaw, or they don't have any of that, they're complaining of upper and lower right side pain on teeth. You look at the x-rays, nothing's going on. They're definitely clenching hard, chewing hard on one side. The ligaments, periodontal ligaments are bruised, over torqued. And in a couple of weeks, that could relieve itself because they baby the area. But if they're clenching hard, again, what's the cause of the clench? Is it anxiety or stress or is it sleep related? So the first conversation or the question I have when I uh, assume that it's uh, a TMD situation is how well do you sleep at night? I want to make sure I can, if the patient's answering that they have sleep issues, they snore, they're tired throughout the day, they take drugs to fall asleep. That may be an indication. First, the patient needs a sleep study as opposed to making them a, a flat occlusal plane night guard or occlusal splint, right? I've had patients, of course, if you can imagine, completely refuse that a sleep study. Say that they don't have sleep issues. They And you look in the tongue, you see the tongue scalloped, they have narrow arches, they have lower anterior wear. So what do you lead to? Well, and then I treat them as a TMD patient and make them a, a flat occlusal splint so that they can have the uh, capability. And this is very important because if you see that there's a possibility of sleep apnea because of the landmarks and the medical conditions, but the patient is refusing to go through the process of evaluating that, you should not make a splint that restricts the patient from clenching and grinding forward. If you'd imagine when they have that apneatic event possibly, they may be restricted if there's something in the front of the splint, like an NTI, for example, to push forward. You don't want that. You want them to be able to grind forward if they're only being treated for TMD because they're refusing their sleep apnea to be evaluated. Um, other things I do, if the muscles are tender, I, I do Botox here for my patients. That's another way I treat TMD. Um, in the masseter and temporalis area, the most popular areas. Um, and then, of course, there's supplementation to help calm the muscles and heal the joints, which we can go over later. So in terms of acute onset, um, obviously, one of the things I generally recommend are anti-inflammatories as well to help reduce the inflammation. Um, do, you, do you also instruct your patients with jaw exercises? I'm just saying before before the splints made or before, before that treatment of, you know, um, is there anything that, that would provide sort of relief for the patient? Uh, before you could move on to the more sort of, um, you know, things that can do, you, you know, things that you can do for them. Yeah, uh, you know, like, you know, the Medrol dose pack, ibuprofen, Aleve, of course, those are things that can help, uh, but getting off prescriptions, um, you know, chiropractic relief, uh, finding a local chiropractor in your area is very big to be able to um, help with the, any sort of TMD. Um, I personally don't give them any instructions to do at home. The only thing I tell okay. them is I call it food hygiene. Stay away from chewing gum. Stay away from chewing ice. Don't eat raw whole almonds or hard nuts because any sort of, or steaks, any sort of tough chewy stuff or hard stuff will exasperate it. Um, and so those are kind of, um, and then you, you, know, you can get as, uh, as soft of a, of a recommendation as meditation and relaxation. 
uh, gratitude, meditation, these types of things before sleep has been clinically shown to reduce uh, clenching. So these are kind of like home things to do or to avoid, uh, foods to avoid, and then also uh, calming things that you could do, listening to calm music before you go to bed, that can help. So in terms of obviously treatment options, you mentioned that, and, and obviously it's very common for dentists to treat with splints, um, you know, and there's lots of different range types of splints out there. So, so which one is your first port of call and why, and what are the different treatment options and how do you decide which one to, to prescribe for who? Yeah. So, so the tools in the toolbox, typically I do a hard, uh, soft, uh, talon splint, um, uh, upper, for example, flat occlusal plane, as we discussed, uh, to make sure that if there is any sleep apnea, they can grind forward. Um, I almost, if the muscles are a problem, meaning tenderness in the muscles, almost always recommend Botox to alleviate not having to take muscle relaxants, such as Soma or Roboxin. Um, if the joints are very uh, uh, worn down, popping, clicking, Medrol dose pack, um, and then, of course, I you know created a supplement called Rad Jaw. Uh, that's an all natural way of taking uh, chondroitin sulfate, glucosamine, MSM, magnesium, calcium, vitamin D, all these things to help. Uh, so th these are the tools in the toolbox that I provide to my patients. And sometimes I refer them to for chiropractic care uh, to be able to have some sort of physical therapy and of and the foods that we talked about to avoid. That's been the secret sauce, so to speak. Um, for appliance. Now, if the patient does have sleep issues, uh, I put them through the sleep test and we fabricate a sleep appliance to act as both a occlusal splint and a sleep appliance. Um, and we can lead into that if you like regarding which sleep appliance to use that's best for TMD patients. Yeah, I'm just going to just ask in terms of effectiveness, what, you know, when you've treated patients over the years, what's been most beneficial has the Botox would you say is the most effective or is it the splint what 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 sort of relieves relieves the the sort of pain or the difficulty for the patient most quickly uh, you know uh, as if they have clenching more than grinding issues uh, the, the Botox is almost a must uh, neck and shoulder pain headaches those are indications of muscle induced TMD and that needs to be softened of course having a hard splint helps so that the tooth the tooth contact doesn't occur so you don't get the full contraction of the masseter the temporalis when the clench happens um but it, it's in all the patients that i've treated which are in the thousands i've seen that it's almost a combination of everything botox is the one that may not be there if it's if the muscles are not uh one of the major causes it's just a joint inflammatory issue so when do you use a soft splint and when do you use a hard splint i, I never use a soft I actually, okay. um, with all due respect to the listeners, I think that's detrimentally really bad for their TMJ because what you're doing is you're protecting the teeth, but you're activating just like using a stress ball. If you look at your forearms, when you use these squishy stress balls, the muscles are working. So you're making their masseter, temporalis, SCM, the neck muscle, the trapezius, all get stronger by giving them a soft. So a hard soft combo, which is soft on the internal, more nicer to the teeth or to your veneers and a hard chewing surface. Uh, one of the brand names I think is called Talon, T-A-L-O-N, okay. Splint. That is the ideal situation for these types of patients. Excellent, excellent. That's uh, interesting, isn't it? And I'm sure uh, people will have different sort of opinions on, on, <laughs> on, on that. And that's what dentistry is all about because we've all got our own little way of, of working and, and, and there's no right or wrong answer in, in a way. It's whatever works for you and what works for your patients and at the end of the day you know you're, you're doing your, your best for your patients so um you know i just wanted to ask in terms of um cost wise how much uh, how much do you charge for an appliance and how do you decide what you charge for an appliance so uh, a sleep appliance um when we're doing that route the best appliance out there and there's so many um and i, and I have no endorsements here from any uh, companies out there is is the sleep herbst appliance h-e-r-b-s-t herbst has been around for decades um it is medicare approved um it's one of those appliances that gives you the most freedom of movement when you're wearing it 
Uh, you know, the, the left and right, right grinding is allowed. Uh, you can open your mouth if you need to, because some people have allergies. They can't breathe through their nose or deviate septums. And breathing through their nose, although, although ideal, um, is not possible. You can still help close the appliance together with rubber bands on little, uh, they, they call them canine hooks um, around the canine area. But the sleep herbs is the ideal appliance. And uh, I, I typically, in, in the Los Angeles area, I charge uh, 1,995. I haven't heard it less than 1,500, and I hear it as high as 3,500. That includes the first year worth of uh, warranty from the lab um, and also any sort of adjustments that it needs. So start to finish, it's basically $2,000 for a sleep appliance in my office. Um, if you want to talk about Botox, I charge $12 a unit. Most patients need about 30 to 50 units. And again, that's uh, up to your discretion on how you learn to do Botox. It's a completely different course. Um, Clusal splints, people charge anywhere from 500 to 800 for a hard soft splint here. Um, uh, but, but typically a sleep appliance is around $2,000. Um, medical insurance, PPO has coverage for it in, in most cases, as long as the deductibles are not involved. Um, and uh, can you bill <laughs> uh, a night guard under dental to, and make a sleep appliance for a patient to get the cost down? Absolutely, it still acts as an occlusal splint. Um, whether you put a NTI in there or a hard soft talon or a sleep herpes, it's still acting as a, as a uh, D7420, I think it is. It's a, a, basically a, a, a night guard or a occlusal splint. Excellent, excellent. That's uh, really, really useful. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to a little bit ask about can a dentist refer a patient for sleep for a home sleep test and how does that happen? Yeah, there's many companies out there um, that are catering actually to dentists um, to be able to refer their patients. So the patient doesn't have to go to a medical doctor and jump through that hoop. Um, they, again, you, you said something um, and, I'm, and I want the listeners to kind of think about this. They do really trust us. <laughs> uh, they're, they're really, in, we have relationships with most of them uh, that, that they like to us to guide them. Sleep is an emotional situation for people, especially the last two or three years. It's affecting people's ability to be with their families and have enough energy for their kids the next day. It's affecting their work um, and, their, and their focus. It's affecting uh, their activity at the gym. Uh, being able to work out or have the energy to go work out uh, could affect them while they're sleeping, their medical well-being, their depression and mood, their mojo, so to speak. So all this said, a dentist can refer for a home sleep test in, in most states. Um, I believe I think New York is one that has said that you, um, you, you can refer it, but it has to be through, you have to refer it back to a medical doctor. Kaiser or HMO patients have to be referred by an MD. Um, even if you accept Kaiser Dental uh, plans under your uh, office, you cannot refer directly for a sleep study. It has to be referred to an MD. Why, do I, why am I giving you this answer about how important sleep is um, and the emotional benefits? It's because don't be afraid to talk to a patient about it. And maybe they do have to go to an MD because of their plan. Um, but for you, you're, 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 your job is to look in the mouth, look at the medical history, ask them and tell them you can help them because we are the second line of defense. First line is CPAP machine or oxygen machine. Second is oral appliance. Third is surgery. And those are the three recommendations for mild, moderate or severe apnea by a board certified sleep physician who interprets the home sleep study or the lab one. So, um, and you need a home one that qualifies for a diagnosis by a board certified sleep physician um, for sleep apnea. You don't have to go to a lab, which is very beneficial for a lot of patients. Um, I don't recommend buying your own sleep equipment as dentists. There's companies that sell you that because you cannot diagnose it. Some of the dentists give the equipment to their patient. Patient takes it home, but staff has to call them. Oh, did you, can you bring it back? Did you use it? And they have to plug it into the computer and have a board certified sleep physician on one of the portals that they have to pay to diagnose it for them because dentists are not allowed to diagnose in any state um, in America sleep apnea. You're only allowed to screen for it. You're allowed to refer to an MD for it or a home sleep testing company. And if a home sleep testing company that you use 
um, such as I, I use the sleep apnea team, SAT. Uh, if, if you're using them and they need a doctor, they'll talk to the patients or medical doctor, they'll talk to the patient for you um, when you send the referral over to them and say, we need a referral from your medical doctor. Your plan requires that if you wanna um, use your plan. Um, and so that's kind of like the process, so to speak. You are allowed to screen, send for a home sleep test and treat with an oral appliance if the patient chooses to do so. Wow, excellent. It's interesting because at dental school, generally we're not really, it's not really discussed sleep and, you know, obviously we're sort of aware of anti-snoring devices and things like that, but it's an area that not many dentists really go into. And it's interesting how your own personal sort of experiences really sort of propelled you into wanting to know more and trying to fix this problem for you as well as the patients. And it's interesting how insomnia is, has been massively on the rise, especially probably since the pandemic and, you know, the catastrophic sort of effects that's having on our mental health, on our emotional well-being. And generally, we're kind of probably very st stressed individuals generally as dentists anyway, because of our job and things like that. But it's, it's interesting how sleep is being massively, massively affected. And this is a huge problem. And I'm so glad that, you know, a dentist is, is, is there trying to fight this cause of uh, helping their patients sleep because sometimes, you know, they can go through rounds of tests with medical doctors and everything and no one can find a solution. So it comes to me, brings me nicely on to, you know, your kind of uh, baby, which is Rad Health and you know your um, things so so tell me a bit more about rad health and how uh, it can help uh, patients really so uh, as you said a few uh, two and a half years ago now um, when our patients were coming in i've treated over 4000 patients now with oral appliances since i became a, a very very passionate dedicated patient what does that mean they're not all my dental patients. There have been referrals from other medical doctors in the community. And we can discuss really quickly how you can get referrals uh, to kind of build your practice in sleep. Um, but uh, these patients come in every six months for me to make sure their appliances look good. They're not cracked. The screws are tightened for the sleep herbs. It's basically a checkup. Uh, and again, those the first year, all, all that's included. Uh, after that, I, I charge them $55 per visit, uh, just letting you know what I do after the first year. Um, for, to make sure the appliance is, is doing well. The complaint I was getting is, Doc, the appliance is working. I'm not snoring as much or any, I, 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 but it's my mind. So I'm taking Tylenol PM, Advil PM, half a Xanax, Benadryl, NyQuil, and I feel groggy, CBD, I smoke marijuana, I take a gummy. All these are drugs. <laughs> they are liver and kidney toxic or kidney toxic. So I personally, myself, I was worried about my kids. I was worried about my own health, you know, coming and working in a dental office. I was worrying about my staff, taking it back, you know, to my parents when I visit my parents after I'm at the office, you know, lots on our minds. And it's still there. The phone, <laughs> it keeps us up. Uh, Netflix, we have emails and, and a lot of distractions. So I actually created Rad Health because my last name is Dr. Rad Far, and a lot of kids call me Dr. Rad here at the office. And RadZ's, RadZZZ.com or RadZ's was the first thing that I created. It's all natural sleep supplement to help you fall asleep, stay asleep. And an ingredient in there called L-cysteine, it's an amino acid, has been uh, proven by NIH.gov studies, National Institute of Health, to actually help, help you breathe better and lower snoring and apnea, uh, apnea by about 30% just by taking a all natural ingredient mixed with L-theanine, um, I put some valerian root in there, some tryptophan. That all has helped for the insomnia portion of sleep. And it works brilliantly with, for patients who are wearing a mouthpiece because they have apnea and a CPAP machine. So that's how Rad Health kind of started. Uh, it then it transferred into all this clenching and grinding. You mentioned all the cusps that are broken off and all the amalgams that are very, I mean, I've never pulled more teeth and done more crowns in the last two years than really the first like 18 years of, of practice. Um, and then Rad Jaw was created again under the Rad Health brand to help with the chondroitin sulfate, glucosamine, MSM, magnesium, with the inflammation and, and joint therapy. Um, and all this is is kind of become really fun for me because I like to go on a natural route to help my patients and really 
uh, outside of my office, uh, anyone who's interested in sleeping better and having less jaw issues. Excellent, excellent. So you mentioned, I think dentists would be interested in this, about how to uh, get more sleep apnea patients to your practice. Yeah, so so let's say uh, you come into my office, uh, you have, let's say, 10 hygiene patients a day, um, or any kind of patient, and you see the medical history and the and the um, and in the mouth that it's a conversation you want to bring up, right? So you, I ask you, how well do you sleep at night? And you tell me, I'm not sleeping that great. Uh, I'm actually sleeping in the couch. <laughs> My wife tells me I stole. Okay, you know, doc, I can help you with that. Is that something that you'd be interested in? And we can refer you for a home sleep test. You go through the process. Now, I've actually done through all my courses. I've trained over 10,000 dentists in the United States of America on how to do this, by the way, in my seminars. Mm -hmm. And we've done all the statistics. For 10 people, for every 10 people, you open your mouth and you see that there is a problem. Three will tell you, yes, I have a problem. One will get a home sleep test. All right. Out of that one that gets a home sleep test, the majority, close to 75%, get some sort of treatment. All right. Whether it's an oral appliance or a CPAP machine. Once I do the sleep test on you and I get results, I'm asking you on that appointment when I review the results with you from the home sleep testing company uh, that, that you, you took the sleep test with, what other medical doctors do you see in this neighborhood that treat you? GI doctor, cardiologist, primary care, urologist, psychologist, anything that is endocrinology associated with your sleep. I communicate to these MDs through a letter. It's basically a template that I created called letter to the MD that says, dear Dr. Smith cardiologist, our mutual patient uh, was diagnosed by a board certified sleep physician after I discovered he has large scallop tongue, dry mouth, high blood pressure. Um, and you know we're going to have him be treated with a CPAP machine with Dr. Mehdian, for example, who's a board certified sleep physician that will provide him the CPAP. That's who I refer to for CPAPs. Um, if you have any questions uh, about our mutual patient, please feel free to contact. And I send that letter to every medical doctor that you have that, have, that, that is correlated with sleep and your, your diagnosis being positive. They need to know that there's a possible comorbidity associated. And once I treat you for the sleep or Dr. Mantian with the CPAP treats you, you may need to adjust your medications. You may need to be treated differently. That builds a connection with the medical doctors in the community. My staff a week later after sending the letter does a follow-up with them and asks, did you get our mutual letter? Who is this? This is Dr. Radfar's office. Um, and there's a lot of times where the, patient doesn't have medical doctors and they need to be addressed because the sleep study shows cardiac arrhythmias. It shows that, uh, you know, and they don't have a cardiologist. So my angle is to go to these medical offices that we have mutual patients and meet the doctor and see if we can have some sort of relationship together where I can refer to them because my dental patients that I examined and did all this work up for need a they have frequent nighttime urination. They may need a urologist. So I'm basically letting them know I'm here to serve them and I'm hoping they can serve me back. So, and th that's how I get into their offices is by communicating what I've found about a mutual patient of ours. Excellent. That's fascinating, isn't it? It's medical professionals working together there to get the best outcome for your patients. And I think your patients really, really, value that they'll really really appreciate the fact that you're not just looking after their oral health you're looking at after their general health and you you want to make sure that you know they're as healthy as possible they're performing you know in terms of um you know their their life in terms of every single day and sleep is a huge part of everyone's life and sometimes we we sort of don't really give it that importance or we don't really even think about it and there may be people we know even even us as dentists we might be suffering in our sleep and things like that so i just wanted to to, to sort of give some tips for for our viewers and listeners with regards to people who perhaps suffer from a bit of uh, sleep problems or uh, insomnia and things like that what what kind of things can we practically do to help us sleep and sleep hygiene is quite a big term that's been used quite recently as well 
Yeah, so uh, great question. Uh, you know, you said all these medical and dental implications of poor sleep. Let's not forget the most important for many people is the social, uh, going camping, being embarrassed with their snoring, sleeping to a, with a new bed partner, uh, and having to uh, put a mask on that they've been kind of embarrassed to use or not using nothing at all. And they know they have this problem where an oral appliance can really benefit them uh, discreetly to help them with their social well-being when they're sleeping. And so some of the things that can help improve our insomnia or even our, our, our breathing during sleep is, is trying to avoid things like alcohol, um, trying to avoid things that are sedatives. Believe it or not, you taking a Xanax, a Tylenol PM, an Advil PM, a Benadryl will make your apnea worse because you're actually relaxing and uh, uh, the tongue is more kind of in your mind is more shut off and you're not able to these to have this kind of fight or flight response. So apnea will get worse with over-the-counter aids if your airway is not open. Um, it's, you know, these doctors who give Ambien and, and all these Xanax and then Valium and all this for sleep, uh, if, or marijuana, which can dry your mouth. A dry mouth is, is really bad for sleep. So, you know, drinking lots of water, staying away from coffee or energy drinks at least eight hours before your bedtime, having a routine bedtime so you have the natural melatonin production, which is typically between 10 p.m. And, and 12 p.m., depending on sundown in most areas. So have a, have a set routine. Uh, I know it sounds foofy, but meditation helps tremendously. Positive gratitude affirmation meditations on YouTube, 10 minutes, listen to it before you go to bed, um, helps to calm the mind. Um, those are kind of, you know, uh, basic I call it hygiene or sleep hygiene that you should avoid from or do to be able to sleep better. Excellent. And how strong would you say the link is between anxiety, stress, and mental health and sort of sleep problems? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's number one right now. I mean, the number one problem that I'm seeing with my patients and people all over the country uh, and some people in, in other countries that are using my Rad Z sleep product and the reviews that I'm getting is you're, you, I, I feel happier the next day. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, when you sleep, you just have a better mood. When you have better mood, you're nicer, you're more effect, you're more um, on your game, so to speak, at work. Um, you have more energy with your kids to play with them, to be all this, uh, the serotonin production for depression. There's so much associated with sleep chemically and um, just energy wise, right? Um, and also most importantly, we, we, we forgot to talk about this. Everyone's really big on their immune system, right? We wanna make sure we have a healthy immune system to fight anything, to, uh, whether it's COVID, whether it's uh, the flu, if it still exists or common cold and all these things, right? If your immune system's not up to par uh, because you slept poorly and we've had those nights in dental school, right? You remember where you slept, didn't sleep at all and uh, you, you feel run down. Uh, and, and, and your immune system is depleted, it needs to be rejuvenated to be able to fight disease. Um, and, and especially something called cancer, five times higher risk of cancer of any kind if you're not being treated for your sleep apnea, and even if you have the mildest form of sleep apnea. This wow, is serious stuff high, uh, mentally and uh, uh, towards your overall health. Yeah, wow, it's, it's just amazing because you don't really see the link sometimes about how sleep can impact your alertness your cognitive function your mental health as well as your general health as well as your immune system it, it's almost linked to absolutely everything it's sort of a vital part of your life and like you said it's a third of your life and it's something that more and more people are having issues with and more and more problems we're finding with sleep quality and sleep things and would you say these this new modern way of living with smartphones and constantly sort of being bombarded with with information uh, in a way as well as negativity would, would you say that has a huge impact on, on on why people are getting these conditions now yeah i mean like you know if you and i were watching the news every night and all come being bombarded with uh let's call it slightly biased news that's very negative right uh, it does wear on you i mean you, you, it's it's just too much negativity lack of af gratitude <laughs> Yeah. Gratitude it brings anxiety down. That's part of the meditation process, part of the feeling good process. Um, but yeah, I mean, your smartphones, you should technically try to be off of it at least 30 minutes. Any electronic within 10 feet should be 
put to the side at least 30 minutes to an hour before bedtime. So you don't have that constant screen, uh, blue screen image in, your, in the, the back of your mind that uh, increases brain activity. You want it to be more at a, at a calming uh, pace where you maybe read a book that can calm you down, right? Or listen to a podcast. Um, so the, those are all very uh, big, but one of the things that is we, we touch on is kids. Uh, kids also are being really affected by sleep. We're talking like, you know, ages two and up. And uh, my son, who's 13 years old now, at two and a half years old, went through uh, major surgery because he had pediatric sleep apnea. And how do we know that? He was snoring. Kids should never snore, period. Um, he was moody, uh, very aggressive, grinding his teeth, um, and he was struggling. So pediatric ENT, uh, evaluated him, saw that his tonsils and adenoids were very large, affecting his breathing. Uh, we, I, we, I made a courageous decision as a parent, as we always do with these situations, to put him through surgery. Best decision I've ever made for him up to this point. Um, and he, he was breathing better, not snoring. He went from 30th percentile in growth to 60th within six months. Not to mention whatever is expected in the cognitive development that we, we advanced uh, at the tender age of two and a half. Um, and your pedo patients, uh, doctors <laughs> and staff and hygienists and whoever's listening, um, when you look in the mouth, you can see bruxism. You can see tartar on the lower front and more mouth breathing. Um, you may see retruded mandible. If you do orthodontics, you may want to recommend phase two, uh, phase one orthodontics by fixing the mandibular retrusion, bringing the jaw forward with an appliance, right? Before all the adult teeth come in. You may want to ask the parent, how's your son or daughter sleeping? Refer them to a pediatric ENT. If the parent doesn't do so, even though you see stuff, at least you did your uh, oath, your duty, so to speak, by, by at least giving them the, the information. We are number one in seeing if there's a sleep issue. More than any physician out there, we are the ones that see the patient the most frequently, and we are the ones that look in the mouth that can... Now I, I kind of told you guys how to do this, large scallop tongue, lower anterior wear, class five abrasions, malum potty forward, narrow arches, medical conditions we discussed about. And also we are the second line of defense to treat this. <laughs> so it behooves us to, if you do implants, you do Invisalign, you do any sort of other thing besides restorative, this is our responsibility. Take a, a course uh, in sleep, there's so many out there. Um, to, to better educate yourself. Um, Are there and, any particular and, ones you'd recommend or any ones that you, you're aware of that you, you've heard good things uh, about from colleagues? I don't, you know, I, I actually have my course that I can email people. It's a five-hour course. Uh, if, I don't know if anyone, if there's a capability of emails being put into this, uh, let's call it chat or, um, or uh, into the Facebook. I will look that up and send them my Zoom or a link uh, free of charge. <laughs> Uh, the more I get people like us, professionals and, and staff and whatnot to, to help with this cause, the less likelihood someone will fall asleep at the wheel and crash their car into a dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and that's been my passion because I would never be the same person if I hurt somebody with what happened to me. Absolutely. You sound so passionate about this cause and you sound really, really kind of genuine concern for your patients and from genuine concern, which which is amazing, because obviously we discussed your life story on the previous podcast and and things. And I think it's really, really important because I think, you know, I've more and more been more self-aware myself, but we, we're, we're living in times where it's information overload, where, where this the vast range of information that we're getting from our smartphones, you know, in, in terms of Google and things like that, it's, it's more information that was present for over 2000 years. Somebody said once about what's, you know, the stuff that's on, on Google now, and even, even like the choices in terms of what we're watching on TV, in terms of the news, in terms of we're constantly being bombarded with information and that, that must seriously affect our mental health um, significantly. Yeah, you know, this whole concept of mental health and positive thinking and affirmations and gratitude and all that has been really coming up because of what we're dealing with, with respect to everything that is very negative uh, out there. And uh, sleep is the forefront. So again, what are we to do? Um, you know, you, when you, if you don't extract 
uh, wisdom teeth that are impacted, what do you do? You refer it to an oral surgeon, right? If you are, don't do orthodontic care, such as metal braces, you refer that to an orthodontist. Um, at a minimum, you have the right to look in the mouth for oral cancer. It doesn't mean you're going to biopsy it, you refer it. Um, at a minimum, try to refer a patient to a medical doctor in the community that does sleep, such as a pulmonary specialist. If it's something that's not for you, I just gave you guys the tools to look at the medical history, look at the mouth, have a conversation. Three out of 10 will say yes. The other seven may not truthfully answer or uh, may not have it, uh, even though they are showing the signs and symptoms of it. And hand over a card. At least you've done your deed as a good human being for this cause to help better their lives medically, mental health, and even socially by sleeping next to someone. And exactly, you just never know. It's like you, you, you explain, you know, your, your son's, uh, your own personal story about how it changed his life. And I'm sure that crash and you getting diagnosed, it's improved the quality of, of your life. And, and, and that's the key about this. It's, it's all about improving the quality of someone's life. And if you signpost somebody, diagnose something, find something, you know, it's not just, you know, obviously, you know, we're all always on the lookout for all cancer and things like that when we're examining our patients and sleep is something we never really thought of. But imagine if, that conversation you had as a dentist about sleep completely transformed the way they, they live their lives. You know, how grateful would they be for that? Dr. Hussain, do you have any children? I do. I have three children. Okay. Very, very young so children. imagine you're, 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 you bring your patients, your children to my office, and I, they're there for their two bite wings, two of PAs, exam, fluor, fluoride, and, and, clean, and uh, cleaning, right? And I look in there and I see the signs of grinding and lower anterior tartar and retruded mandible. And, and I go to you, I, does your son or daughter sleep okay? You say, I've noticed some problems snoring. And I give you a card for a pediatric ENT. The pediatric ENT dis discovers adenoid tonsils. They have the surgery. Everything goes beautifully. How do I look to you the next time you come in for your own treatment or your kids? I mean, it it's almost like a superhero. I, ch I change the path of your child just the same way I change the path of my own. Um, and and it 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 it's emotionally humbling. It, it made me zero to do that, by the way. I yeah. made nothing from that. But it, it's not all about that. It's uh, after a few years of, you can make your money and sleep, uh, but after a few years of doing this, the thank you and the, the emotional hug that I get from a parent, priceless. Absolutely. That's amazing, isn't it? I'm, yeah. I'm so, um, this, this podcast is meant to be about that. It's, it's meant to inspire dentists, inspire the dental community to think about, actually think outside the box, think about, you know, what, extra thing could we go how could we go that extra mile for our patients how could we actually you know things that perhaps they might you know they may not even bring up with because they may not even think about seeing another healthcare professional it, it's you who they come to see regularly and you're in that privileged position and imagine if you could improve the quality of their lives just by having this this simple conversation yeah yeah and, and you know to do it you don't need to be board certified um, you know, you can take a course and you can learn how to treat sleep apnea with an oral appliance. Remember, you're not diagnosing anything. You're just screening and treating or referring for a CPAP. So as long as you feel comfort uh, to treat, then, you know, and where does it start? Find some, do it for yourself. <laughs> uh, do it for a spouse or a family member that you know has trouble sleeping um, or do it for a staff member or their spouse. Have a meeting um, in your office, right? Uh, just say, hey, uh, by the way, my beautiful four staff members, does do any of your significant others or parents or anything like that have any problems sleeping or have snoring issues? I guarantee you there'll be a few that will say yes. Do it for them for free. We spent thousands, hundreds, thousands of dollars on our education doing something, an appliance that costs $350, $400 and having the patient go through the process that knows your office through a staff member or through yourself um, gives you that comfortability when you do one or two like that you'll be more comfortable in uh treating your patients so just to sort of finish off our thing is if you snore does that mean you have sleep apnea or not um that's one of the indicators that you may but you can snore and have a very little or no apnea to a point where you're not diagnosed remember the definition of sleep apnea is the stoppage of oxygen 100 percent 
breathing stop, which is called apnea, and hypopnea, which is a 50% or more oxygen decrease in the amount of breath that you take. Snoring could be 75, 90% of your breath. Um, and you have none of the other uh, apnea or hypopneas uh, and your pulse ox doesn't drop when you snore. And so therefore apnea does not necessarily mean that, or snoring does not necessarily mean you have sleep apnea. I still treat the snoring patient the same way, the same appliance. Don't use a cheap appliance out there for a few hundred, a hundred dollars or whatnot. That's plastic. A sleep herps is the most durable appliance on the market. Excellent, excellent. So, do you, for people who snore, is there anything? Is it this appliance that you'd always recommend? So, if somebody said that my partner's always snoring; it's getting up. You know, it, you know, I can't sleep because of it. How would you treat that? Yeah, the appliance is uh, number one. Uh, putting them on a CPAP machine is is aggressive if they don't have apnea, especially because they've been tested for it. Uh, Rad Z's that helps lower your snoring by about fifty two percent. The sound wow. is is decreased. So I'm very proud of that. The, the combination of the five ingredients, all natural ingredients in Razzies to help with that. There's nasal um, uh, strips kind of help to open up your nasal passage. Um, that, that, that's, a, that's been a big help. Uh, there's other things that, you know, um, there's sprays in the back of the throat that help all these things, but really the, 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 the oral appliance is, is the big one. Losing weight can help if you're overweight um, and, and, and that, that helps kind of uh, orthodontics can help <laughs> expanding right. the arches, right? Uh, especially if you catch it at a right age uh, and giving more, there's a thing called DNA appliance that's out there for adults that kind of moves and re, kind of changes your, your, the way your palate is to make it more flat. So the soft palate is further back. So there's a lot of orthodontic ways that we can create more room for the tongue that will also retreated mandible correction. Those are all ways to reduce snoring. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So yeah, um, really, really inspirational uh, talk today about sleep apnea and TMJ and kind of looked at, you know, in a, in a holistic way of how you can treat sleep apnea as a dentist, the conversation we should be having, the things that we can see in terms of uh, treating TMD as well. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, us dentists actually play a crucial role in this in this condition and I think we need to become more aware of it and become sort of have these conversations as part of uh, you know standard kind of protocol yeah it's definitely different it's beautiful when you put you know eight veneers on top or give a beautiful smile or you know to, uh, put an implant in it looks great and replace the tooth this is and I do all those things by the way 75 percent of my practice is all the stuff on the menu uh, of dentistry but Nothing's more have, has been more rewarding, not only financially, but emotionally. When you have a patient that comes in a week or two later after appliance and go, I'm sleeping next to my husband again, or I'm sleeping yeah. next to my wife again, thanks to you. Um, and of course, I go, you, you're welcome, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> you never know. Um, or, or just they're in a better mood, or they, they're just happier with their being a father or a parent or a, or a coworker or, or a boss. Uh, this is all emotional. Um, and when you touch them there, You'll see better acceptance rates when you recommend that cusp that fractured. You'll see better acceptance rates with and people refer, them referring people to you. Your practice will literally bloom. And it does take a little bit of time. It's not overnight um, to, to grow your practice like that, whether you're getting referrals from MDs or from your own patients. But open your mouth to have the confidence to at least talk about it, to be able to at least send them to a physician for a sleep study. Um, and then learn how to do the oral appliance or find someone in the area that can, just like you refer for orthodontics or oral surgery and help these people. Excellent. Excellent. Really enjoyed having you on here, Dr. Radfar. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. And I hope the, the group uh, really, really enjoyed listening to, to you. Is there any last, last thoughts you wanted to, to finish off with? No, I mean, if any, if any of you guys are um, interested uh, in the, the seminar that I put together, um, I put it online uh, through a Google Drive format. Uh, again, all I would need is your email um, and I can send that to you. Uh, I, I love sharing the knowledge and you can learn really how to do it. Um, because it's not live uh, and whatnot, it's hard to provide CEs. So, so don't ask me about that. Um, but there are other courses. Get yourself educated more to do this um, and practice on someone and uh this is something that when you get rejected by a patient, don't let it deter you. 
um, from keep asking the next one. Uh, you know, if you see a cavity, you're going to continuously recommend whether someone rejects the composite or crown on the next patient, you'll do it. This, this, this is actually, is, with all due respect to all the dental professionals, slightly more important than the dental care that you provide because <laughs> of the whole total well being, let alone helping with their dentistry, because now they're not clenching and grinding as hard because they're not, uh, they're being treated for apnea. Absolutely. And what about your products? They're available. Are they? Yeah. So uh, Rad Z's, uh, Rad, RadHealthInc.com or RadZZZ.com uh, will get, get you to the website. Um, uh, if you punch in the code uh, Rad, R-A-D, you'll get a discount uh, for any of the products you want to try. Um, and I, I, I love the stuff that I'm adding. Uh, I'm doing a new product called Rad Fresh. It's a spray bottle for Invisalign retainers, night guards, uh, dentures, sports guards that'll help disinfect the appliances and help strengthen your teeth and uh, pull off some plaque based on the ingredients that I have in there. That's coming out soon. It's been a lot, a lot of fun to uh, better the oral health and, and eventually the total health of the patient. Oh, excellent. Sounds really, really exciting. So yeah, thanks uh, for listening, everyone. I um, hope you really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed listening to Dr. Radfa and I hope, uh, you know, it's inspired it's inspiring people to think about sleep and maybe they'll reach out for help for themselves. Maybe they'll start having more conversation with their patients. Maybe they'll change the way they practice dentistry and think, you know what, this is a way of me really going that extra mile for our patients and really, really showing that we care for them. And it's a lot easier on your back and on your neck when you treat these patients. <laughs> uh, for some of us that want to like overdose on doing so much dentistry, um, adding this as an adjunct or at, to your practice is a lot easier on the body um uh with, with with respect to physical dentistry it's almost nothing <laughs> brilliant uh thanks for watching guys and we will be back in two weeks with another guest and take care and enjoy the weekend thank you guys thank you for listening much love thanks, thanks. bye